Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science in the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome back to our series of POMEPS Conversations, where we talk to leading scholars in Middle East Studies about their work and about the world. Um, with, with us today is uh, Gershon Shafir, who's in the Department of Sociology at the University of California at San Diego. And he's the author of many books, uh, including one of my personal favorite books uh, written about Israel, Being Israeli. And he recently, uh, he has a new book, an edited, co-edited. Yes, it's a co-edited volume with Mark Levine, who is a historian at the University of California at Irvine. And it's called Struggle and Survival in Palestine slash Israel was published by UC Press in um, September of 2012. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, what were you trying to do uh, with this book? And uh, just tell us a little bit about what you found. Okay. Well, most of my work is fairly analytic, and I would uh, describe it as dealing with the larger impersonal forces that shape uh, Israeli-Palestinian lives and conflicts. But this is a um, what I would call an ant's eyes perspective rather than a traditional an bird's eyes perspective. perspective. <laughs> yes. In other words, a collection of life histories, so I call them social biographies, in which we, um, uh, both Mark uh, Levine and myself and many of our co-authors um, uh, interviewed individuals or on occasion used uh, memoirs written by people or um, stories told by them to family members and others, lives of people who appear to be of, uh, of interest and um, uh, in order to get a sense of the intersection between biography and history, how people's lives were enabled or sometimes constrained mm -hmm. by some of these larger impersonal forces and how they um, acted in situations in which their choices were sometimes very constrained. Uh, in other words, the focus is on, on, on um, right. actual agency and decisions that people uh, made, sometimes in fairly atypical fashions. So what kind of people did you, in, did you uh, focus upon? How did you select them? Well, the, we try to um, focus on people who um, are not in history books, mm -hmm. though in some cases we ended up with people who might have been in history, but only uh, in the um, covered in just a few pages, uh, and um, uh, therefore the stories that they have to tell are also of um, of great interest. Well, give us some examples. Like, what are some of the people who you wanted to focus on who don't get written into the conventional histories? Um, for example, uh, there is a book, there, there is a, a chapter on um, a Palestinian refugee from a village in the uh, north who ended up in Syria and then became part of the Palestinian, um, um, uh, he lived in a Palestinian refugee camp and later on he joined the Palestinian, various Palestinian resistance uh, movements infiltrated into Israel. So he a dynamic, he, the, the, he, his life uh, really uh, was constrained both by the um, fact that he was a refugee uh, and by the limits placed by the Syrians uh, on the Palestinian uh, community uh, while trying to um, break away from um, these constraints by becoming a member of the Palestinian um, um, resistance movement. That would be one example. Another example is somebody like um, Hillel uh, Cook, who was one of the founders of the um, uh, of Beitar, and later on he played a major role in the United States. He, he During World War II he was in the United States, okay. and he uh, uh, tried to organize a uh, the American Jewish community as well as um, American public uh, figures and movements to assist in saving mm -hmm. European Jews. Uh, and uh, subsequently he returned to Israel. Uh, he was a right winger, but somebody who began to develop a sense of a civic identity in mm -hmm. Israel that would include, uh, based not on religion, but rather on uh, common citizenship. 
And did you find uh, uh, common themes linking the Jewish and Palestinian experience, or did you find them to be significantly different in terms of the amount of personal agency and the constraint by structure? There was a very clear difference. In Israelis had a much greater amount of freedom in making decisions because they were part of a successful state building project. And therefore, you find many times a conflict between the individual uh, choices and collective ones. Uh, somebody like um, uh, Yizhar, one of the famous Israeli writers of the 1948 generation, uh, was um, Sabra, who nevertheless um, uh, felt uh, alienated in many ways both from the immigrant community that has been created and from the labor movement of which he was a part of, something that you discover in his, um, in his writings. Now, let me look back at some of your, some of your earlier work. Uh, you and Yov Pellet wrote uh, a wonderful article back in 1996, I oh. think it was, which really drew a profound link between internal Israeli political economy and society and, uh, and the peace process. Yes. And I, I think that was one of the, the path-breaking articles mm -hmm. which really linked the domestic with the foreign mm -hmm. policy. And you know, reflecting on that almost 20 years later, um, do you see similar dynamics unfolding today uh, in Israel, linking what's happening inside Israel to how it approaches the Palestinian issue? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, most of my work really made the argument that notwithstanding the view that Israeli society has been shaped by processes and by individuals who were immigrants and therefore they, therefore they um, um, imported ideas from Eastern Europe, from socialism, nationalism, and so on and so forth, I've always argued that some of the most significant characteristics of Israeli society are really a way of reflecting on and responding to the conflict itself, mm -hmm. including some classic institutions such as the kibbutz, uh, settlement movement, um, the relationship between Ashkenazim and Mizrahim, and so on and so forth. Uh, some of that has obviously changed because we, um, not because um, um, Israeli state in many ways has um, gained um, uh, resources and uh, developed identities that uh, are much more um, internal. Nevertheless, uh, I think some of the most significant uh, dynamics are still shaped through this, uh, to the conflict. Um, if you look at Israeli high tech, a great deal of it developed out of the Israeli military. <laughs> if you look at, um, and I'm going to talk about it today, about uh, Naftali Bennett's uh, The Jewish Home party, the Baita UD, uh, many of its members actually have come out of the Israeli military as well. Uh, and there are other um, mm -hmm. uh, institutions, the Israeli legal system, uh, some aspect of it are very clearly the, the, the contested position of the Israeli Supreme Court uh, is due precisely to the place that it occupies in the context of the conflict. So it might not be possible to pinpoint very specific influences, but that nevertheless, the influence of the conflict is diffuse and um, a very a significant. Now, with the uh, the second intifada and the construction of the security wall and the kind of the greater insulation of Israeli society, perhaps from the West Bank, it's not like the intifada where you have. Uh, you know, soldiers routinely patrolling mm -hmm. uh, uh, Palestinian cities. Um, does that change the nature of the impact of the conflict on Israelis? Are they more insulated from it now? Or do you still see it as something which is deeply constitutive mm -hmm. of who they are? Well, one of the um, uh, reasons for the great deal of Israeli complacency in um, regard to the, to the conflict really has to do with the fact that so many of them have been isolated uh, in one way or another. You know, Tel Aviv is described as a state of mind as much as a mm -hmm. geographical location. Uh, so I do believe that uh, that has played an important role in basically becoming indifferent or complacent about the uh, conflict itself. 
Uh, and um, uh, as far as Palestinians are concerned, there's much less interaction. Uh, there are Palestinians who used to work in Israel, though uh, in, 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 in menial positions, nevertheless, there was a, s a certain amount of interaction between them and, um, mm -hmm. and um, Israel. It's not these are truly um, separate societies, with the exception of the, of the West Bank, uh, where um, a certain measure of interaction does take place, but of a very different kind, yes. What, what about Israeli Arabs? I mean, their participation in this election was notably low. Uh, does this speak to a deeper trend in the, the kind of the way Israeli identity is being c constructed? Well, uh, you know, in the book that you mentioned, The Being Israeli, we talk about three alternative um, constructions of, of identity in Israel. One is a um, republican form of citizenship, which is based on uh, a sense of virtue of, of a commitment to a public good, which actually has come back in a much narrower sense hmm. in the recent elections, where uh, a emphasis on military service seems to be one of the um, keys, one of the uh, basic uh, 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 claims of, on behalf of um, rights and benefits and privileges that people should be getting. Uh, so that has disappeared and now it is com coming back. It has been a traditional discourse uh, of the labor movement. Now you find it in different uh, segments of society. Secondly, a Jewish uh, identity. And thirdly, a civic one. Okay? Right. Now Palestinians uh, uh, have never been part of the Republican framework. They cannot make claims on behalf of the common good and they are certainly excluded from the Jewish ethno-nationalist version. So the more civic Israeli society becomes, the greater uh, opportunities or the, uh, that there are for Palestinian citizens of Israel to uh, participate in political life. But um, uh, that civic identity is very much struggling. It is in conflict with both of the other two, and which is expressed in the fact that Palestinians even as citizens uh, feel second or third class citizens. Uh, citizenship, nevertheless, is very important for them. Under no conditions would they be willing to uh, relinquish it, but they would like to find a, a civic framework within which uh, the individual rights, uh, both civic, uh, political, and social, are equalized with Israelis, but also uh, they would like to be allowed to define themselves as a parallel uh, ethno-nationalist community with its own vision. Because of this will, this is in some way uh, going to be on foreign policy, I feel compelled to ask you one final question, which is, based on everything that you've been saying, do you still see any reasonable possibility of, of a negotiated two-state solution? Is that, is that a goal for which it is still worth Mm -hmm. the effort, or have things changed so much that it mm -hmm. that we need to look at other alternatives? Where, where do you stand on, yes. on that? Well, uh, you know, it's uh, Meron Benvenisti who many years ago claimed that the Israeli settlement project has gone too far mm -hmm. and cannot be reversed. I, however, grew up at a time when one of the rock solid facts of international relations was a country called the Soviet Union. Okay? <laughs> and to use a, an expression, I believe, uh, of uh, Leon Trotsky, the Soviet Union ended up in the dustbin of history. So uh, the concept of restoration actually has been around for a long time, really from the Napoleonic Wars, when many of the countries conquered by the French armies later on uh, came to um, uh, be, uh, the dynasties that were expelled from them came to be restored to, um, to government in there. And later on when the Soviet Union was, um, um, it broke up again. Countries that were um, a part of the Soviet Union became independent again, such as the Baltics and others. So I don't really accept the notion that history is a train that only goes in one direction. You don't believe in irreversibility. I uh, do not think that history is uh, irreversible. Nevertheless, some of the forces, some of the settlement blocks that have been created, obviously uh, carry a great deal of. Um, uh, 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 they are very significant in the terms of the influence they have within Israeli society. But I would distinguish, I would say, instead of talking about settlements, 
there is really no such thing as settlements. There are three, at least three different kinds. You know, there are security settlements along the Jordan River. There are messianic settlements, which are really not messianic anymore in the, in the, on the mountain to, mountaintops. And sec thirdly, there are the um, suburban settlements adjacent to Israel. And each one uh, has very different kinds of interest. Uh, and some are um, um, more attached to, um, it, 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 some are potentially uh, more reversible, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. than others, depending on uh, some of the um, um, international circumstances and domestic dynamics. So you think there's more room for, uh, for engagement here than some other people do? Uh, yes, I say never, never say die. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good place to, to, to conclude. Thank you, uh, Gershon Shafir of uh, UC San Diego, and thank you for joining us at the Pull Maps Conversations. Thanks for having me.